The Gran Turismo series is well known for being a franchise of innovation, always pushing the PlayStation consoles and racing game mechanics to the limit. With Gran Turismo 4, things weren't different. It is definitely a groundbreaking title that changed the racing game genre forever. But with the next generation of consoles on the horizon, the expectations were high to see what Polyphony could offer this time around. To give players a peek what was coming next, they released a demo in 2006 called Gran Turismo HD, just to show the graphical capabilities of the new console. But ultimately, it was just a demo, so to really demonstrate what Gran Turismo 5 would be, one year later, 10 years after the very first Gran Turismo game, Gran Turismo 5 Prologue would be released to the public. It introduced some neat new things in the series, like the interior view and the online play. Something Kazunori Yamauchi has wished for since the beginning, allowing up to 16 players to race at once. And it also had a sort of career mode separated by classes, the one-make races, the local multiplayer mode, and of course the arcade mode. So the Gran Turismo 5 prologue was full of content, no doubt about that, but it was still just a prologue, and the full game was nowhere to be seen. Did it set up false expectations for the next game? Well, Gran Turismo 5 took 5 years to develop, got delayed for quite some time, and was one of the most expensive games in development at the time, with a budget of $60 million. Now in retrospect, we know that this game is the best-selling PS3 exclusive, but does that make it worth playing after 13 years? Is it better than its predecessors? Did it hold up to the expectations? Let's find out. Taking a look at the user interface here, it feels kind of weird, especially if compared to Gran Turismo 4. In the arcade mode, the cars are not separated by brands anymore, so you have to keep scrolling through a bunch of random cars until you find the one that you like. And in GT mode, it can get a little overwhelmed by how everything is sorted. It feels confusing, too much stuff going on. Some icons are really small and others are really big. If you want to go to the options, you have to press a little button at the bottom left of the screen. If you want to take a look at your garage, it's another little icon that you have to find. It doesn't feel intuitive, but rather confusing. In comparison with Gran Turismo 4, everything was there at reach, simple but effective. But let's talk about what feels more important for a car game, the car list. There are a little more than a thousand cars in Gran Turismo 5, and if you haven't played the game before, you might be thinking, oh my god, this is simply amazing for a PS3 game, I can't wait to play it. And yeah, you're not exactly wrong, especially since this is the first game in the series to have a first-person view, without considering the GT5 prologue, of course. But the problem begins exactly there, because 810 of the 1079 cars in the game are what Polyphony called standard cars. Cars that were recycled from Gran Turismo 3 and 4 that don't have a cockpit view and are very pixelated and can only be bought at the used dealership. GT5 Prologue gave us the false impression that all cars were going to have interior views. Well, I'm not saying it is exactly a bad decision that Polyphony made, because having a huge car list is always great when it comes to racing games like these. But if I have to be honest, having a really well-polished car and a low-res pixelated one at the same race it kind of breaks the immersion, and it's a weird design choice too. The interior in standard cars are just black voids, but each one is shaped in a different way. So the interior of a Jaguar E-Type standard looks totally different than a random Toyota interior. They took some time to work on it, but at the end of the day, it is still just a black interior. We know that they used a lot of cars from the PS2 game, but let's talk about the new things that Gran Turismo 5 brought to the table. We have new tracks such as London, Madrid, Rome, Cape Ring, and of course the Top Gear track, including a special event in which you race around the track on the famous TV show with a Lotus, a Samba bus, and a weird Volkswagen vehicle that was used in World War II. Talking about special events, this is where the game truly shines, introducing some brand new events. Kart racing and NASCAR driving experience both never seen before in the series. Uh, just ignore the weird looking Jeff Gordon over there. He's just there to introduce us to the NASCAR events. Hi, I'm Jeff Gordon, professional NASCAR driver. The AMG Driving Academy, which consists of doing some various time trials with the 300 SL and the AMG SLS around Nürburgring in both dry and wet conditions. 
Fun fact, this driving academy is based on the real academy in real life. The Gran Turismo Rally, similar to what we're used to seeing in traditional rally racing games, is now here, though probably better than GT4's rally. The Gran Tour, sadly this isn't the same Gran Tour you might be expecting, but it is a series of events that takes place all over Europe and feels like a nice and calm road trip, or you can also think of it like it's Need for Speed the Run in Europe. And last but not least, we can take some rally lessons with Sebastian Loeb himself. In the previous titles, B-Spec was a useful feature especially at endurance races, so you didn't have to play for literally 24 hours straight. But things changed in the first Gran Turismo to be released on the PlayStation 3. A-Spec and B-Spec are now separated in the career. They have the same races and championships, but the progression is not related to one another and the price cars are different. In other words, you'll play the same races, but in one playthrough you actually control the car, and in the other you watch the AI do it for you. And you can't even speed up the events, so the most useful aspects of the B-Spec races are also gone, and they also double the amount of laps, so it takes forever to do these B-Spec events. They added a bunch of new features to it though, like the mental and physical strength of your driver can change and affect your performance. You can also create different drivers with different skills to help your playthrough. Which is very nice, but I can't see a lot of people spending too much time in this game mode now that you can't fast forward the races. So at least it's a somewhat immersive race director simulator. If we don't consider the low res standard cars, the graphics are really good in general. Just at night the visuals can look a little dated, the light reflections are a bit strange, sometimes everything is so bright that it feels like a flashbang, but in others everything is so dark that you feel blind. And the damage model is finally here, but don't expect anything more than a few scratches. There's a new thing in this game that is worth noting, the level system. Each time you win an event or a championship, you earn XP points, making your level go up. And as you progress in the game, your level will unlock events, championships and cars to buy. So basically, you don't have all the cars available for you right from the start. Although the level system gives you a new sense of progress, which is nice, sometimes you won't be able to buy a rare car that you found in the used car dealership because you don't have the level necessary and God knows when you will find that vehicle available again. It is still a very questionable addition to the game. Some seem to like it, but most seem to really dislike it, as it limits the freedom previous games have offered. As you progress, you can also unlock horns and paint jobs. Yes, now you can paint your car and rims the color you wish. But for that, you have to buy a car that has the color and then it will be available at the GT Auto shop. Talking about GT Auto, the animations of changing oil and washing the car are still here. Sadly, we can't say that about GT6 and GT7 though. About tuning, things are mostly the same as before. You can change rims and spoilers in GT Auto, but there's a new and very interesting thing for specific cars racing modifications. Now you can turn your basic Volkswagen Golf into a racing car. You might be thinking, what is this number and this thing called PP? Well, PP stands for performance points. It's a new concept in the series and it is basically a number that corresponds to the power of your car, making a point of reference and restriction for entry requirements in events. It can also help to indicate how powerful are the cars that you are racing against, but to compensate, the AI isn't very challenging unless you choose a slower car on purpose. Purpose. Track editor adds the possibility of creating custom tracks for the game, but don't expect to have the ability to recreate the Nürburgring or something super complex like that. You're given pre-built tracks and you can customize the number of turns, the road width and stuff like that. Nothing too fancy, but it's interesting nonetheless. GT5 Prologue gave the false expectations that we would have a game with more content, with only premium cars and stuff like one make races. The 5 year wait made us think that this game would be one of the most astonishing games in the decade. With all of the things I've mentioned, should you actually try Gran Turismo 5? Definitely. If you've never played a Gran Turismo title on the PS3, I highly recommend it. It was a fun playthrough for me. The handling has been improved a lot, the special events are very fun, playing this game is an incredible journey just like any other game in the series. This game marked a new era for Gran Turismo, starting to feel more focused in online playing and that can be great too. 
thank you for watching another video. If you enjoyed it, a like and a subscribe does help out the channel a lot. And a big shout out goes to all the patrons and YouTube members that support this channel. Hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day and I'll see you in the next video. Take care.